With this final Super Smash Bros. Ultimate Direct, we now know about a huge chunk of the game, including the final roster, every item, and every stage. But there was one last surprise to keep us curious until its release on December 7th, and that's the teaser for the new adventure mode called World of Light. Although the actual gameplay portion of this trailer was quite short, the implications of what's been shown are huge. This is a single player campaign that seems more focused and more grand than anything in Smash before. But don't take my word for it, we put the old analysis machine into overdrive to discover all the secrets and hidden details hiding in this reveal. So let's begin with this gorgeous opening. It all begins with Fox as he points his blaster toward the new threat, revealing right away that unlike Brawl's subspace emissary, there will be voice acting this time around. Unfortunately, there's not a lot, just a grunt from Shulk and a single line from Marth, Zelda, and Pit. However, this is very clearly not Patricia Somerset playing Zelda, which makes sense since it's a completely different princess. This also isn't a clear indicator of how often cutscenes will pop up. It could literally be limited to just the beginning and end, so it's best not to expect a lot. After all, not even every character is featured on this cliff. Instead, it only shows Rosalina, Charizard, who's separate from the Pokemon trainer, Falco, Captain Falcon, Pikachu, Mewtwo, Zelda, Kirby, Bowser, Mega Man, Samus, Mario, K. Rool, Pit, Link, Shulk, Fox, Pokemon trainer with Ivysaur and Squirtle, Marth, Simon, Palutena, Snake, Sonic, Both Inklings, DDD, Wii Fit Trainer, Villager, Donkey Kong, and Lucario. But considering that Greninja is soon seen from another angle and Dark Pit, Duck Hunt, and Diddy are later featured, it's obviously meant to imply everyone is there in the beginning, despite the fact that over 35 characters are missing from this lineup. What is a great touch, though, is the fact that this is the same cliff from the end of Subspace Emissary, meaning this is definitely still the same world of Smash Brothers. It's then that we finally get to see the threat that the characters are facing, hundreds of master hands surrounding the new villain, Gleam. While its name has no specific meaning, it does sound similar to Gleam as in Gleaming Light, but this connection is made even more overt in Japanese, where its name is Kira, which similarly riffs on the onomatopoeia for Shine or Twinkle. If it wasn't obvious from its design in the name of the adventure mode, Light is a major theme. But amusingly, the name Kira is of course close to the word Killer, both in English and Japanese, and based on the outcome of this fight, yeah, that name works really well. Galim's design is that of a ball of light surrounded by wings, but it's the color of those wings that has us curious. They're the same shade of blue and red as the Smash 4 version of Final Destination. It's impossible to say if it's a direct callback or an interesting coincidence at this point, but Master Hand does exclusively appear on Final Destination, so it's fitting at the very least. And yes, there definitely seems to be hundreds of Master Hands in the air, as Marth comments that they'll each have to take down 10. If every character is there, that's well over 700. But even if it's just the one spotted in the cutscene, that's still over 300. And you thought Taboo controlling one hand was impressive. Rather than attack with the Master Hands directly, they instead unravel into blue streams of light, which is a similar color to Taboo. Maybe he could appear in this adventure in some form too? This light feeds into Galeem and Shulk immediately has a vision of the future, just like in Xenoblade Chronicles. Unfortunately, there's seemingly little he can do as Galeem shoots out dozens of beams of light. Before this moment though, Galeem becomes a literal void in the sky. Could his true form be hidden within that void, or is it simply a construct of his power? Either way, the fighters prepare themselves for this onslaught, but there's little they can do, although individual moments for some of the characters are quite impressive. Link is able to deflect the light with a Hylian shield, which is the only equipment shown to even withstand its power, but the sheer force of it knocks Link off balance and he's vaporized. Zelda is also shown to have incredible bravery as she gives one of the most hardened looks of all the fighters. She knows what's coming, but tries to stop it anyway. Sonic could probably outrun the light, but he slows down and reaches back in an attempt to save Pikachu, just like the animal buddies from his own games. He's simply too late to do it as Pikachu is overtaken, and soon he is too. 
The Pokemon trainer attempts to use his final smash, triple finish, but it isn't enough, though his vaporization is hidden from view by Bowser. Probably wanted to avoid showing a kid getting wiped out like that on screen. But another tie to their own series continuity is Palutena. Once she's destroyed, Pit and Dark Pit lose their flight and follow soon after. The final three characters shown being vaporized are Wii Fit Trainer, Duck Hunt, and The Villager. Understandably, The Villager is panicking and running in circles, which, yeah, not much else he could do. The Duck Hunt dog is simply trying to hide while the duck flies them away. They achieve some liftoff before the light hits. But the strangest is Wii Fit Trainer, who simply does a yoga pose before the light hits. Except that's the tree pose, which is significant. After all, in Smash Wii U, there was a brief moment of invulnerability when she used it for her up smash. This could be a reference to that ability, but I suppose she just mistimed it here. Or, you know, she could have literally been trying to make like a tree and leave. But there's one moment that may be even cooler than all of this. We mentioned before how Shulk had a vision yet was unable to do anything. That might not be the case. As observed by Yuri MK9 on Twitter, the camera angle for when Shulk turns to the others is incredibly low, even below Mario, which could mean he's looking directly at Kirby and knows he's their only chance of winning in the end. What a strange coincidence, hmm? It explains why Kirby was escaping on his Warp Star, pushing it to its limit until he's able to momentarily pop out of reality. Yet while Kirby does escape, we never see the actual fates of many members of the initial group. Shulk, Mega Man, Mario, Simon, K. Rool, Fox, Marth, DDD, and Donkey Kong are not shown being overtaken, but considering the fact that a section of the galaxy was, it's safe to say they were vaporized too. Especially since we see Mario in chains and being used to create clones and fuse with spirits later. And in a nice nod to continuity, Kirby isn't shown in the lineup of cloned characters. Before moving on though, we want to give a special thanks to our fan, Kirk Weathers, on Twitter for the use of this image. As we mentioned, the way these clones are given life is by infusing them with the wandering spirits of those caught in Galeem's light. Here we see a smoky prog spirit enter Mario, but earlier in the cutscene we see Darknut, Pigma, Annie and Moe, Joan, a Han and Bo Electroplankton, and a Zinger all overtaken before wandering the wasteland. There seems to be only one character left that survived Galeem's onslaught, and that's Kirby. And in fact, the spot Kirby crash lands on is the same rocky area that many of the reveals in Smash 4 took place in, such as Mega Man and Bowser Jr. Again, it shows how the Smash games are one big interconnected world. It's here that the new theme song, Life Light, begins as he overlooks the massive world players will have to explore. But before we take a look at that world, we wanted to mention a few curious aspects to the world of Light and how it connects to Kirby. For one, as noted by Kuhn Meverse on Twitter and translated by Kyle McLean, the Japanese title for World of Light is Tomoshimi no Hoshi. And when the characters for that is read backwards, it becomes Hoshi no Kabi, which is the Japanese name for the Kirby franchise. That's not the only connection though. As pointed out by Vivace Harmony on Twitter, the singer of Life Light in Japanese is Shinichi, who happens to be the same singer for the first theme song for the Kirby anime. <laughs> Sakurai has always worn his love for Kirby proudly, but this is a major step even above that. Now while Kirby is the one who begins this journey, it's certainly not solely focused on him. Just look at this cinematic view of the overworld. Starting from the left, we see a castle town lined with walls and small homes. A few blue towers can be seen as well, but this area may be more of a Fire Emblem reference rather than Zelda's castle town. In fact, there's the castle siege map in Smash, although this town lacks the red flags that fly there. As we'll soon see though, there aren't always exact matches as many locations feel like amalgamations. 
Above the castle town is a canyon-like area that's a bit too nondescript to place exactly, though if we had to guess, it could be Gerudo Valley. However, there are vines that can be seen just above that, so maybe this is Viridi's reset bomb forest from the Kid Icarus Uprising stage. Continuing further above that is a snow-capped mountain which very likely connects to the Ice Climbers. Looking to the right, there's a floating island, but it's difficult to determine which one. Is it more of a reference to a specific game like Skyloft and Skyward Sword, or is it based more on a Smash stage location like the Temple or Palutena's Temple? Unfortunately, it's hard to say for sure with just this image. Moving back down, there's a strange area dotted with purple crystals, though we can't exactly place what that might be a reference to. It's possible that some areas are original to the mode itself. But then we move further down and see an entire city filled with skyscrapers. It doesn't quite match any of the city stages though as there's no New Donk City Hall and it's not as gaudy as New Pork City. Perhaps it could be Saffron City, but that feels like a bit of a stretch. Continuing down, there's an odd land formation that resembles a set of steps, while the areas closer to the foreground appear to have holes dotted all around. While we're again not sure if this is a reference, we can quite clearly see a stone bridge that's likely the Bridge of Elden. Strangely, there's some kind of blue light glowing up from within that crevice, though we can't say what it might indicate. But moving further down, we can spot some ruins that appear Grecian in origin with plenty of columns, perhaps indicating a connection with Kid Icarus. To its right is a rainbow, and while we can't say if it serves as a bridge, it's also possible that this serves as the site for the Rainbow Ride stage. On the other side of the rainbow is another city, but this one is a little easier to place as Foreside with some of the buildings matching its cityscape. Above this city is a forest with some oddly colored trees or perhaps balls sticking out among the foliage. The final locations to note is the volcano at the top right, which is likely Death Mountain, while more floating islands hover nearby. At this distance, their designs don't look too different from what was on the left, but it could be any of the places we listed before. More interesting is the second castle town which could be Hyrule Castle, but we can't say for certain. And just below that, there seems to be a structure built into the rocks that reminds us of Suzaku Castle. However, all of this is just a cinematic interpretation of the map. The actual map has way more variety in its areas in series representation. Our first look at the World of Light map is likely its introduction as the camera pans upward with nearly every location covered by clouds. However, there is one break as we see a location with a ribbon and an icon shaped like a person surrounded by Galim's wings, along with other nodes that are simply circles of light. As we'll soon discover, these nodes are the different challenges players must take on in order to progress. In fact, we'll see this same location later on without the cloud cover. For now though, the camera guides us to the top where Galim awaits behind a force field as the ultimate goal but it looks like the fight with Galim won't be happening anytime soon. As we'll see, there's a lot standing between the heroes and their ultimate goal, and that all begins with Kirby on a lone mountain with a path leading down. We believe that this is the starting area of the World of Light. For one, it's on top of a mountain with no way up other than the path Kirby is taking, and that path is important because this world can't be freely explored. Instead, the player follows the different roads and routes which we'll see later in the trailer. There are several options available while in the overworld as well. The back option in the top left allows the player to leave the mode at any time, while the L button shows the full map and the R button tilts the camera angle for a different view. Finally, the X or plus button is used to bring up a menu which is likely specifically tailored toward the adventure mode. This is probably where players can manage their fighters, spirits, and other aspects of the mode, including a skill tree. Oh yes, in addition to the advantages the different spirits can provide, the characters can be powered up through this skill tree. The big question though is whether each character has their own set of skills or if it's shared amongst your party. If we had to guess, it would be the latter, especially since there's already plenty of customization in regards to spirits. The center of the skill tree is marked by a sun symbol with different nodes branching out. However, rather than gold coins, a different currency is necessary to unlock the nodes. Will these be earned through battles, exchanged for coins, or found in the chest that we can see spread throughout the world map? It could even be all three. Many of the nodes have different symbols, each indicating what kind of bonus they might provide, but they aren't the same as what was used for Smash Run. 
Based on the symbols, we believe that the sword is for normal attacks, the shield is for defense, the shoe is for speed, the hammer is for items, the medical bag is for healing, and the strange X-like symbol is for specials. But what kind of bonuses we can expect for each category is still unknown. All we see is that the left sword node grants an increase to your character's tilt attacks, which costs 15 of the new currency. And a later example is shown where more of the tree is filled out and has reached the edge, although we can still spot the sun in the center. But naturally, the nodes do become more expensive as this attack node increases the power of tilt attacks by 2, but costs 40 units. However, it appears that players can choose to turn the skills off later as they say on when activated, so presumably they can be turned off. Still, it's a curious addition to have when spirits already power up characters, indicating that this won't be a short adventure at all. Returning to Kirby, we see him encounter his first spirit node on the map, which provides basic information, which includes the image of the spirit, a small symbol indicating the fighter using the spirit, the star level, and its specialization. In an earlier part of the Direct, we saw that spirits can be focused on attack, defense, or grab, with each one being effective against and weak to another. But this confirms that it's possible to have no specialization, although we think this may be more prominent toward the beginning of Adventure Mode. Once the battle is selected, a screen appears to show more details of the coming battle. Here we see which series the Smoky Prog is from, Mario's power level, the rules, the stage, which looks to be the battlefield version of Distant Planet, and the conditions. As both the conditions and rules note for this battle, the Smoky Prog grants Mario the ability to metal shift, meaning he will randomly become Metal Mario during the fight. Players can prepare for these conditions using the party button, which is where different fighters can be chosen and spirits can be equipped. We actually see an example of this later in the trailer when the spirit equip screen is shown. Isia from Ash Archaic Sealed Heat is the primary spirit and she's already been raised to level 70. However, because she's only a 1 star, the team power has only increased to 3500. Supporting Isia is Cap'n from Animal Crossing, who makes dodging easier, and Hal Emmerich from Metal Gear Solid, who allows the fighter to begin with a beam sword equipped. There's plenty of more information though. Players can save any spirit team they create and view them later to easily equip at any time. It's also possible to remove spirits without selecting new ones or allow the game to choose the recommended spirit. In the top right, we see that Pikachu is the opponent and he's equipped with an attack type spirit, meaning Isaiah's defense typing is a good matchup. Rather than fight right away though, the scene goes back to show that it's Peach who's preparing for this battle, although a new fighter can be chosen from the menu, which we don't actually see. Naturally, choosing fight starts the battle, bringing us back to Kirby vs. Mario. And this itself is another callback to Subspace Emissary, as the very first fight in that mode was Kirby vs. Mario, with the player choosing who they wanted to be. And that was a reference as well to the first showdown shown in the opening of Smash 64. But unlike Subspace, there's no such choice between the two, and Kirby seems to be at a disadvantage with no spirits selected. However, we do believe that any spirit unlocked through Spirits mode will be usable in World of Light right away, paving the way for a cohesiveness between the two modes, because once the fight actually begins, we can see that Kirby now has a spirit equipped, Charlotte Olin from Castlevania Portrait of Ruin, although we don't know what help she exactly provides. What we do know is that the game will warn players when Mario's Metal Shift occurs, just in case you miss it from being far away with the camera zoomed out. Another aspect of the battle is that the final smash bar has been activated, showing right away that the battle modes will be changing constantly. And this is shown immediately in the next fight, which has Kirby taking on four Inklings, each equipped with Octoling Spirits, while Kirby has the Tronbon Spirit from Mega Man Legends. The attention to detail when it comes to matching the spirits with different fighters, stages, and modes is incredible though. In the case of the Smoky Prog, it appears on the Pikmin 1 stage, and the Metal Shift indicates just how tough it is to defeat in its game, and Metal Mario was an unflinching opponent in Smash 64. With the Octoling Spirits, matching them to the Inklings is obvious, but there's also the choice of Midgar, which could match the strange technology of the Octo Valley locations. And this isn't a stock or time battle either, but an HP battle. Again, just like the fights against Octolings in Splatoon. Considering the medals in the top left with the number 4 nearby, we believe Kirby has to defeat 4 of these Inklings. 
It's a weird addition though when there's already four Inklings on the map, so it could be that when each Inkling is defeated, a new one arrives to take its place. However, it's also possible that a different number has to be defeated, and four is how many Kirby has beaten so far, but we have a feeling it's the former option. The next battle shown has Kirby facing off against Palutena and Ganondorf on the Temple Stage. Kirby is using the Rhine Spirit from Xenoblade Chronicles, while the two of them are equipped with the Nina Spirit from Fire Emblem New Mystery of the Emblem, who is a Bishop class in that game. That also explains why the two of them are constantly regaining health, which is likely the condition of this battle. But why would there be two of them in this case? Well, Palutena is meant to represent Nina herself, while Ganondorf is likely a stand-in for her husband, Harden, who becomes corrupted over the course of that game. Again, the details to make each of these spirit battles feel unique is simply impressive. These are only three examples of what appears to be dozens, if not hundreds, of different battles. It seems like a massive effort to represent each character properly. The trailer returns to the map, which takes place not far from the starting area. We can even see the hill in the southeast. However, the player now has control of Mario rather than Kirby. Well, there's a reason for that. As Mario enters the ruins, which seem to act as a kind of hub, there are three figures surrounded by Galeem's wings, each one representing a character that needs to be rescued. It stands to reason that in order to enter this central area in the first place, Kirby rescued Mario from one of those same nodes just in the south. So in order to even access the rest of the map, Mario has to be rescued first. You didn't think Sakurai would keep him waiting long, did you? More importantly, this scene shows that characters do follow set paths on the map. When Mario reaches the center, four red arrows appear to show the optional directions, confirming that players won't be able to run around freely. And as we'll soon see, this has a big effect on how exploration is handled. Mario chooses to go left though, showing that Marth is one of the early possible characters to rescue. His equipped spirit isn't shown, but we can see that it's an attack type. Defeating him will likely not only bring him to your side, but clear the clouds to the west and maybe even lead to a Fire Emblem inspired area. After all, we did note the castle town to the west in the cinematic view of this map. And of course, the actual fight with Marth seems to take place on Final Destination. I mean, how could it take place anywhere else? Rather than see more of the west though, we see Kirby running north next to an area that resembles the sealed grounds from Skyward Sword. Even though heading in there seems to be a dead end, there does seem to be a purpose besides gathering more spirits. Just below Kirby is a cave entrance that stands out from the typical map. Could this be an example of a dungeon? Maybe this is a specialized area where a character that's not necessary to rescue could be found. Or maybe it leads to a large cache of the new currency to expand your skill tree. We can't know for sure, but as far as we can tell, none of the scenes from this trailer takes place in one of these caves. There's also an exclamation next to the menu option now, which we believe indicates new spirits or characters are available for the player to check out. More importantly, to Kirby's left is a castle covered in vines that's partially hidden by the clouds. While there isn't enough to see to say for sure, perhaps this could be the Castlevania area of the map. But there are a lot of characters that have connections to castles, so we can't say for sure. What we do know is that the grass is checkered both to the south and north of Kirby, which is absolutely a Sonic area. Not only does this show that there won't be hard breaks between the themed areas, but it's likely that many of the franchises will be represented in multiple areas. For now though, this is Sonic territory as confirmed by the next Spirit Node, which features Blaze the Cat. Blaze is a two-star defensive support type, and her fighter is the female Robin, though we don't see the exact conditions of the fight. The next location is a bit harder to place the references. The center is filled with forests while rivers and waterfalls run between them and bridges are there to help cross. In the southwest, there's a stump that could be one of two Zelda callbacks. Either it's the stump from the Minish Cap that grants access to the tiny world of the Minish, or it's the stump that the Skull Kids sat on in the Lost Woods in Ocarina of Time. Or it could just be a stump. You never know, it's not like every waterfall and river is from a specific game. Although having said that, there is one lake that's quite curious as it's filled with stars. Now this could be the Fountain of Dreams from Kirby's Adventure, but it lacks the water spouts normally found there so we can't be completely confident. Northwest of that though is what appears to be an airport which could tie into Pilot Wings in the Pilot Wings stage. And to the right of that is our first chest. 
We mentioned these before when talking about the skill tree, but we're still not sure what's inside as one is never opened in the trailer. It could be extra spirits, gold coins, the new currency, or even a trick in the form of Kid Icarus Uprising's Mimikyuties. But the obvious thing to spot in this scene is Master Hand itself. Kirby has come to a complete stop as this short scene plays out, where Master Hand destroys the bridge to the nearby fighter node, and it's definitely destroyed as we can see splinters of wood shatter beneath it. The big question is though, does this happen every time? Do Master Hands randomly destroy paths around the map? Does it have to be defeated in order to continue forward? Well, no, not really. As we can see on the map, there seems to be a northern path Kirby could take to reach the nodes on the other side. It's more of an inconvenience, really. However, there is one more location on this scene that's worth pointing out. Just beyond the Master Hand, there appears to be a stadium of some kind. This could be the location of a Pokémon Stadium, or the Boxing Ring, or it could just be a random nondescript building. The next scene is in the northeast part of the overall map, as we can see the volcano nearby. By this point, Shulk has been rescued and is exploring a hot spring area to the south. Notably, there are no spirit nodes around, which could mean that they've all been completed. But that also indicates that they can't be rechallenged for fun if the player desires, unless it's a feature for after the World of Light is beaten. What's strange to us, though, is the new symbol that appears on the bottom left that looks like a little cave opening. Does this indicate that something special is needed in order to traverse the terrain? It would explain why Shulk needs to press A in order to jump into the water. That option would likely not be there if he didn't have the appropriate item. But the question is, is it a special item that's needed, or a certain spirit? Well, we might have our answer later on. There are two buildings of note nearby as well. The first is in the southeast corner, and while the design is nothing noteworthy, the symbol on the front is. This triangle is the same symbol used to indicate a primary spirit. So either this building is a shop where more spirits can be purchased, or it's one of the gyms mentioned during the Spirits Mode section of the Direct where they can be trained. We're not really sure which it might be, but there will definitely be more to do in the World of Light with the spirits than just powering them up through battle. The building at the top left of the scene is actually a train station featuring the spirit train from Spirit Tracks. It's a 3D model as well, unlike the rest of the map, so maybe it can be interacted with in some way. Perhaps the train can be ridden to reach the volcano. Moving on with the trailer, the next area has us intrigued. While we're not exactly sure what the area might be referencing on its own, it does feature Ness following the path and collecting food. There's even a counter in the bottom corner. Is this a take on Kirby's Gourmet Race? It's not quite the same, but this does seem to be a minigame to break up the usual action of the adventure mode. The problem is, we don't exactly know why. Is the food necessary to feed something and continue on? Does a certain amount need to be collected in time? There's no timer, so we don't think so. Maybe this is an alternative way of earning the new currency. But at the very least, we know it won't be all spirit battles all the time. The next location is quite curious, a small town next to the beach, which we believe might be a representation of Woohoo Island. More notable though is the Pokemon trainer who has the same option to press A like Shulk before. Even the cave symbol appears in the bottom left. However, rather than just perform the action, the Pokemon trainer summons the spirit of Lapras so he can surf across the water. Really, who has time for HMs anymore? This would seem to confirm that certain spirits are necessary to cross obstacles. However, because one didn't appear for Shulk, we think they only appear on screen like Lapras the first time they're used. There's also the question of whether only one particular spirit can solve the puzzle. Does it have to be Lapras, or could any water-based spirit be used? Unfortunately, that question can't really be answered, but the fact that Lapras is being used across the ocean could mean that the water can be freely explored. However, we don't believe that will be the case. Instead, there will likely be set paths to reach locations, just like there are on land. After all, there's still more cloud cover south of the island that the trainer reaches. There, he discovers a nearby spirit node for the merman, but this is a rather curious moniker as this character was referred to as a fishman in Wind Waker. So either the Smash translation made a mistake, or Nintendo has officially changed the name. Though we think Fishman is a bit closer to what this character actually is. The Merman is a one-star support spirit that is an attack type. However, it seems to be stronger than the player because of the arrows pointing up. The actual fighter in this challenge, though, seems to be Squirtle, which is significant. 
Up until this point, Squirtle, Ivysaur, and Charizard all maintained the Pokemon Trainer symbol no matter which one was out. But if Squirtle appears here, then that means that these three Pokemon can appear on their own in the World of Light. The next area features a more mechanical landscape that seems to be wholly original, at least when it comes to the blue and pink catwalks. The pipes and other machinery beneath bear a resemblance to Midgar, but just as Ness was in an area that focused on a new gameplay style, so too is Peach. Her challenge is more of a maze puzzle featuring Splatoon's Zapfish. She has to use it in order to activate currents and presumably open the way forward. Unfortunately, the scene cuts away before we see the actual effects. But there are definitely more Zapfish to find as there's a counter in the bottom corner along with chests and even a fighter waiting to be rescued peeking out from the bottom. The question we have is whether there's enough Zapfish for every power node or whether they have to be strategically placed in order to open the most paths forward. And are the Zapfish collected like the food or are they found in the chests? It's just more questions that don't really have definitive answers. The next scene offers a little more insight into the player's goal though. It's not just running around trying to rescue every fighter. There's a force field protecting Galeem after all. Well, after Lucas defeats a certain enemy, we see its figure fade to black before exploding, which then destroys a nearby crystal. We believe these crystals are what's protecting Galeem, and as we'll soon see, there's more than one that has to be found. Unfortunately, we don't actually get to see the character Lucas face to do this. Maybe it's one of the bosses featured in adventure mode like Dracula or Rathalos. The location reveals it's not either of those two though. For one, we see Rathalos later in the trailer, and second, this doesn't seem like the kind of place Dracula hangs around. But these ruins do seem familiar as they're somewhat close to the brand of the Exalt. It could just be a coincidence, but maybe the boss was a character from Fire Emblem Awakening. Continuing on, the next area is based on Mario, although we're not positive this takes place near the volcano despite all the lava. Here we see Lucario cross a bridge of question blocks in order to hit a switch. This then activates a different bridge made of blocks that are just beyond a line of donut lifts. Now, these tend to fall after standing on them for too long, but we don't think that will happen here. With the automatic movement, players won't be on them long enough to fall. On the other side of the new bridge, we can see more spirit nodes and a green warp pipe, but that leads us to wonder. Could this be what's inside one of the caves that we mentioned earlier? We stated before that there was no solid evidence of what could be inside those caves, and that's still the case. But with the gourmet race with Ness, the Zapfish with Peach, and now this scene, it all seems at odds with what we've seen on the overworld. It would make sense to have each of these as sublocations and act as a different kind of gameplay with more goodies to earn and challenges to face. It's just now you're solving puzzles or fulfilling another mission. We could be off in this theory, but it would explain the change in gameplay. We've pointed out a ton of details up until this point, but the next second of gameplay is by far the most densely packed in the entire trailer. It begins simply enough with Bowser stopped at a crossroads where he can continue to a spirit node outside a dense purple forest and more cloud cover. To the south is the edge of a green warp pipe, which we'll talk more about later, but the most curious thing for us is the new icon above the menu option. It's not shaped like the typical cave, but is instead a kind of shop or building, and we have no idea what it means. There doesn't seem to be anything nearby that would require a spirit, and certainly no buildings. Our best guess is that the fog from the purple forest makes it impossible to travel through without a certain spirit. Perhaps the icon in the lower left is a clue to where that spirit could be found. A cave icon indicates one of the sublocations we mentioned before, while the building means the spirit can be bought at a shop, like the one we saw near the hot spring. We obviously can't say for sure, but it would be nice to have some kind of guidance for roadblocks like these. Soon after, the zoom option is selected and the entire map is shown. However, if we slow it down, we can see way more of what the map has to offer in the world of light. The first zoom out reveals more of the cliffs around Bowser, but nothing of particular interest. Instead, we want to focus on the town to the south, which features Lumios City's Prism Tower. Even the layout of the city is similar to Lumios. Well, the part that we can see anyway. Just north of the Prism Tower is another shop featuring the symbol of the primary spirits, except colored gray. This means that these shops will be dotted across the entire map, if there was any doubt of that before anyway. 
On the left side, there's some kind of gate blocking the road, though we don't know if a spirit will be needed to pass by. And then there's the stadium-like structure in the southwest. We don't know if it relates to Pokémon, but a large building is right next to it, covered in clouds. The second pullback reveals some interesting landmarks in the northeast. There's a heart-shaped lake with some kind of structure leading to the middle, but even that structure features what looks to be a heart in the middle of it. More curious are the ribbons and rainbows crossing over what seem to be huge pieces of candy. The ribbons even have loops built into them, which brings Sonic to mind, though the actual makeup of this area reminds us more of Kirby, Yoshi, or Peach. On top of one of the candies is a wooden bridge leading to a lone building, which turns out is another one of the spirit buildings. Then there's the ribbon to the right of that, which is tied in a bow, and this isn't the first time we've seen this. If you remember the initial reveal of the map and how it was covered in clouds, we saw one break where a ribbon was sticking through. This is that spot. Strangely, one of the ribbon strands leads down into a spiraling hole, but why? At any rate, there's even more to see in the south on the other side of a stone wall. A strange structure stands nearby featuring a tongue leading into the entrance, but the rest of this area is covered by clouds. What's not covered is the city to the west, just below the Lumios-like city. These two areas are separated by a more modern wall with openings leading between the north and south, and between the two, the southern city is far more interesting. On the right side, there's a gray Famicom and a Wii Remote just behind it. To its left is an original Game Boy that has been turned around and has no game cartridge, and we're positive that you've already noticed the Nintendo 64 logo just south of that. But did you spot the gray Wii Mini to the right of it? At least, we think it could be the Wii Mini, as it never came in this color, but then again, the Famicom is only gray and lacks its typical red. Continuing to the left, there's a building toward the center that features an SNES button pad at the top, but the building itself could be based on the GameCube's microphone accessory. And speaking of the GameCube, there's an orange one north of here. But even that isn't everything, as there's a building shaped like the discs for the Famicom Disk System next to it. To the left of that is an actual Nintendo 64, and next to it is the normal Wii. At least we think so. But even cooler than all of that is the building nestled southwest of the Wii. This is actually Nintendo's Kyoto headquarters in Japan. Now, while that's all of the Nintendo console references we could find, there's still one more thing left to note. Did you notice the building with the squiggly rooftop? That's more Ray Towers in Splatoon, so it looks like we could expect a few matches to take place on the new stage there. With the third zoom out, specific details become a little harder to point out, but how locations interconnect becomes easier to see. And that happens right away as just west of the Nintendo City, we can see more of Sonic's checkered grass. But this isn't a new section. There's a nearby hole as well, which is where the sealed grounds would be. It's just in this case, this section hasn't gotten rid of its cloud cover, indicating that the World of Light can be tackled in any order, something we'll see more of as we zoom further out. Moving to the north, we can see another warp pipe, although this one appears black or gray. While all the pipes could be interconnected allowing for a form of fast travel, it seems more likely that each pipe has one of a similar color in another section of the world. Continuing to the east, we get a better look at the Heart Lake in the section containing ribbons, rainbows, and candies. But to the right of that is a section filled with rapids and waterfalls. It seems like the only way to cross is with the stone wall to the south or the purple mountains to the north. While that color change is odd, the crevice with the bright yellow light on the right edge is even more curious. Fortunately, as we continue south, we can see the path that the player took to reach those mountains as it passed by a Mario Kart track. We can even spot the Mario Kart TV logo from Mario Kart 8 adorned behind the audience stands. And zooming out a little further reveals the entirety of the track, which seems to be based more on the figure 8 circuit than the Mario circuit. We also get a better look at the crevice with yellow shining light, which happens to have a bridge to cross it, though that hasn't been done yet. What's really cool though is what we see to the left of the track. Not only is this where the central ruins are located, but Kirby's starting area as well. That means that with this playthrough, the player decided to go right instead of left, and was still able to open up the majority of the map without ever heading towards Marth. It really shows how open-ended the World of Light is. You can go in any direction you like, and still eventually unlock everything, just in a different order. 
Looking around more of this map, we can see that the top left corner has been revealed as well, and that's because of the grey pipe nearby. The player reached the one in the center and used this to quickly reach the top left, getting rid of the cloud cover in the process. However, the player doesn't seem to have explored any further, if they even could. It's just a way to reveal more of the map and reveal goals, something we'll see confirmation of soon. After all, the structure in this location and the glowing vortex in the center makes us believe this is the same location we saw Lucas break the crystal earlier in the trailer. And going with that logic, we can see that the purple mountains seem to contain a crystal as well, although looking closer at them, this seems to be a dark castle town. Perhaps this is actually Castlevania, though we can't see enough to say for sure. We also see more of the massive crevice and the fact that the cloud cover in the northeast is gone, revealing more of the volcano. Finally, the camera fully zooms out and symbols appear to mark important locations. The red symbols are roadblocks indicating that something needs to be done to move past them, which likely connects to the specific spirits like Lapras. The pipe marks a warp pipe which matches in pairs like we theorize. We already located the grey one, and it turns out the green one is in the southeast. However, it's blocked off in some way, which means while you can see it, you can't skip ahead. Kind of like Super Mario Bros. 3 where you couldn't move forward unless you defeated the mini castle. The symbol of a person signifies a character that still needs to be rescued, while the house marks a shop. Or so you'd think. However, this is the only house symbol that appears on the map despite finding spirit buildings elsewhere in the north. So either these houses can only be used once, or this symbol means something different from the buildings we've pointed out already. Even more curious is the fact that the symbol is the same one we saw in the bottom corner before, but there's no way to get a clear enough picture of what that is. There are still more symbols to decipher though. One is of the exclamation switch, meaning it should unlock the way further somewhere else on the map. Then there's the Bowser symbol, which indicates where the player is, and finally there's the swirl symbol. We believe these indicate the location of a crystal, especially since there's one located in the northwest corner of the map. These are the main goals of the World of Light, so it's good to know exactly where to head. The expanded view also confirms something else we expected. There are set paths that have to be followed, although we still don't know if that applies to the water as none of those routes are available. What we do see is that the massive crevice in the land also affects the water as the color is a stark white where it runs. Perhaps the eastern side of the map can't be explored until a certain point? There does seem to be only one way across. We can see the edges where the clouds stop in all four corners, and while there are certain areas that can't be seen, like the water Lapras surfs on, it's easy to imagine them on the map. There are a few more landmarks we wanted to point out though. There's a large lake to the south that's a lighter blue, and on its edges is more of the checkered grass from Sonic. Below that is a massive hole that we have no idea what it could be from, other than marking the edge of the world. Finally, the area near Galim appears to be space, as we can see black emptiness dotted by small white lights. That will be key for an upcoming scene. But the next scene that plays on the map features a larger island that's in the same vein as the water the Pokemon trainer surfed across. Here though, there's a Stonehenge-like structure in the middle, which could be the location of a crystal considering the swirling energy that could be seen there. The rest of the island is filled with tropical flowers and small homes that could bring to mind the Alola region from Pokemon. On the left side is another character to be saved, while just below the Inkling is another extra area that can presumably be entered, except instead of a cave, it's a tropical grove. The next spirit node the Inkling reaches features Shantae. She's a three-star primary spirit who specializes in grabs and is represented by Zero Suit Samus. When entering the actual fight, Samus is in her orange bodysuit to best represent Shantae, while the fight takes place on the pirate ship, a reference to Shantae's constant run-ins with pirates. The rule is item transforming types, which seems to focus on transforming items, another reference to Shantae and her ability to transform into different creatures. We then jump into another battle, this time featuring Affinity Angels from Bayonetta and represented by Pit. It's only a one-star team though with no specialization. Interestingly, there's no rule either. Instead, the conditions are that this is a stamina battle on the Umbra Clock Tower with the enemies having faster movement speed. Not only that, but there are four pits to defeat. Again, both of these fights show just how great the theming is for the spirit battles. 
Continuing on, remember that space-like area near Galim? Well, we think this is where the scene takes place, as the player uses the Great Fox to travel between planets. So either the Great Fox Spirit has to be obtained, or it's a special item to be found. We're still not sure yet. Another thing we're not sure of is if the planets in this image are based on actual Star Fox planets, or are just random additions. This is absolutely related to Star Fox though, thanks to both the Great Fox, and the fact that the character that needs to be rescued is Falco. So because of that, if they are actual planets from the games, we think they'll be from Star Fox. While we don't know for sure, we believe that the purple planet with rings is Eladard from Star Fox 2, while the orange planet could be Katina, with Macbeth as the red planet, and Venom as the green planet. None are exact matches though, so again, it's entirely possible these are just random planets created for the world of light. The next scene features Samus running through a small town that seems to be related to Animal Crossing. For one, we can see a 3D model of Cap'n's bus and a bus stop, so it's possible this path can only be reached with him. After all, there is a tunnel earlier in the path, and the southern path is blocked off with roadblocks and overgrown bushes. So it's possible that Cap'n is needed to reach it initially, and then the other path opens after rescuing the nearby character, who turns out to be Isabel, equipped with a grab bay spirit. Potentially more interesting though is that we can place this town on the world map thanks to the nearby fissure. It's beneath the clouds in the central area just to the east of the Nintendo City, which means it's possible to access this town right away by going north from the central ruins. It really comes down to which way the player wants to go. We then get a slight break from the map with two more spirits. First up is Twintel, who is a two-star support spirit that increases the character's air defense. Then there's Revolver Ocelot, who is a two-star primary spirit with two slots for support spirits available. At level 1, he has 1700 power and is focused on grabs, but there is a note that he will be enhanced if he reaches level 99, so it's possible to make him better. Returning to the map, we see what seems to be a Pac-Man-inspired maze, though it's not exactly the same. Instead, it seems to be more of a teleporter puzzle as Pitt attempts to figure out which way he'll end up. It's definitely worth exploring thanks to all the different spirit nodes and even treasure chests to find, and it's definitely part of the main map since we can see the cloud cover on the outer edges. We next get our first taste of bosses in the World of Light as we see Rathalos fly around the main map in an area reminiscent of its arena from the previous Direct. More importantly, this confirms that this is the mode in which both Rathalos and Dracula are fought. But as we expected, they're not the only bosses. The next scene shows the Inkling in the Shadow Moses base, where we soon see the boss node. However, unlike the characters that need to be rescued, the boss is kept a mystery. At least until the battle actually begins, where we see Gallium from the Subspace Emissary return, presumably taking the place of Metal Gear Rex. Looks like Nintendo couldn't quite get the Rex on loan for a boss fight. But Gallium certainly fits the bill and looks quite impressive, but this also confirms real-time cutscenes as the Inkling is equipped with a rocket belt as Gallium makes his entrance. And considering the appearance of the Shadow Moses base, we don't think the fight will take place on the Shadow Moses Island stage. Instead, it'll be a unique area, much like Dracula has. These aren't the only bosses though. Thanks to the Nintendo Live event in Japan, Sakurai revealed even more about Ultimate and a single image was released related to the World of Light. On the left side, we see both Galim and Rathalos, along with the werewolf from Castlevania Rondo of Blood, Baldur from Bayonetta, and King Balblin from Twilight Princess. Presumably, these three will act as bosses as well. If so, this seems to open the floodgates as Castlevania now has two bosses representing it, and we'd be surprised if death wasn't also fought at this rate. Either way, it's exciting to see who else could appear. Finally, the trailer ends with one last scene of Galim and the Master Hands. However, lasers can be seen shooting at them in the background. Could this be from before Fox's speech in the beginning and he's taking pot shots? The lasers seem a bit bigger than his blaster could reduce though. Perhaps it's from the final cutscene instead? It's hard to say for sure as the scene looks exactly the same as the opening except for the lasers. Either way, that's everything we could find in the reveal trailer for the World of Light mode in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. If it wasn't obvious by now, this new adventure mode is utterly massive. It feels like we've barely scratched the surface of what is here, but we'll be here to cover Smash Ultimate as much as possible up to and after release. We can't wait to see what it holds on December 7th. But what about you? How do you feel about the World of Light? And of course, if we missed anything, let us know in the comments. 
Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe to Game Explained for more on Super Smash Bros. and other things gaming.